back in Indianapolis, home of the Indy 500 again, about 2,000 miles away from home, but making the trip once again to bring you the best things that we see here at PRI. Uh, today, just like always, we're going to be walking around the show and having the whole team actually make their choices as to some of the best parks that we've seen. There's a lot of race car action going on here, a lot of race cars, a lot of circle track stuff too, actually, maybe a little bit out of our realm, but it's still really cool to look at. But a lot of our partners are here, so we're going to look at some of their new products, even some of the old products, so even cool builds. We've even got a few surprises, some old race cars that we haven't seen in a while that actually made an appearance here this year. So let's go. So we're here at AEM to check out what I think is the coolest stuff of the entire show. Now, like, I think electric cars are a thing of the future, and um, internal combustion, like it or not, is eventually going to go away. And AEM is the first people in the industry to uh, respond to that. And they actually have a whole electric powertrain. First guys to market. We have John Romero here, and he's gonna like walk us through some of this stuff. So John, can you explain like what all this weird stuff is? Okay, uh, well first off, I'm not gonna sign on to the fact that uh, gasolines are gonna go away. <laughs> I'm not gonna be in this environment here and, uh, and make that statement. That's, that's, but, that's cause we're old, right? That's possibly, yeah. But uh, yeah, what we're looking at here is, is a typical racing EV driveline. Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful AC motor. Uh, in this case, this is an 840 horsepower motor made by our partners at Cascadia Motion. And this is what's called an inverter. And this is the device that actually takes the DC power from your battery pack and controls it to the motor and makes the motor actually spin. Where we come to play on this is the new VCUs. And these are new from AEM. They're vehicle control units. And, and really the best way to describe these things is they're programmable engine management systems, except they're motor management systems and they're EV, electric vehicle management systems. So they do all of the things that you're used to seeing them do with, if you were looking for a gas-powered car, except they also control all of the EV-related functions that are on a car. So when you get to an EV, especially something that's making you know 800 and some horsepower and it's instant power, these are really tough to drive. So first thing that these do is they're torque management devices. The gas or the accelerator pedal goes into it, tells you what you want to do with the car, and then these take that, takes the traction control algorithm or the torque management algorithm, and actually sends the proper information to the inverter, which makes the car go. Also, when you get back on the brakes, this is what controls whether you're going to get regen or you're going to get some of that energy pulled back out of the tires, back through the motor, into the battery pack. So that's how you make it go. but you've got an entire challenge of how do you make an EV actually function? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff in an EV that you're just not used to seeing if you're a, car, if you're a normal gas-powered car guy. First, of, obviously, is a battery pack. So mm -hmm. the battery packs consist of dozens, in, in performance applications, hundreds of individual cells. Those are controlled by what's called a BMS, or a battery management system. And this is a little device that is just completely focused on the battery and it gives the system information about what's all the cells doing, how much, how much can you safely pull out of this in terms of current, or how much could I regen. That data goes in here and is part of the, the calibration for how fast the car is going to be allowed to go. You've got like, like a lot of it, what people don't understand is managing the temperature and everything of the battery, right? And uh, Oh, yeah. Like for discharge and charging, temperature management's critical, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, a lot of people have seen EVs and they see that they have a radiator and they, they wonder why does an EV have a radiator? Well, an EV has a radiator because it has thermal management issues just like any other car. They don't, they don't expel anywhere near the amount of heat energy as a regular internal combustion car does, but they still have heat energy to take care of. In the, in the setup we have here, I can show you two different spots. The motors themselves need cooling and the inverters need cooling. In addition, usually the onboard charger needs cooling. And the battery pack too, right? And then too, the battery right? pack needs cooling. So you've got multiple devices that all have individual cooling needs that need to be managed, and that's another thing that the VCU does, is it can do up to four cooling loops individually and maintain the, the integrity of the systems. It's super important when you get to the battery packs, because the battery packs, they don't always need to just be cooled. It's very frequent that they need to be warmed. You know, uh, if you're outside and it's 10 degrees outside, you really can't use the battery to anywhere near its full potential. It'll be really derated. So you need to, to bring the battery pack temperature up before you can even start charging and before you can start driving the car with any kind of power usage. 
So the system also operates a, a heating system for the battery pack to bring it up, and it keeps that battery right in the sweet spot, you know, where it needs to be to be the best performance where you can actually take the most energy out of it or you could shove the most energy back into it. That's a real critical thing, and that's one of the core features of the VCU. Yeah, I mean, like the early Teslas, they would go into limp mode after a couple laps around the track, and then... Exactly. Uh, yeah, the Tesla, that was exactly one of the issues the very early Teslas had. But you know, the, the engineers who did it were designing a vehicle that was a, a road-going car, and they expected it to be driven in a certain way. They had the motor, and they had the inverters cooled in the same way. But if you got on it to a track and you just started really hitting it hard and hard and hard, it would slowly start to get more and more temperature, and at some point it started to protect itself and derate everything down. Mm -hmm. Where now, what they've learned, especially with you know, the, uh, the insanity mode type stuff, or ludicrous mode, I should say, is they've learned that you know, they, they pre-chill everything, they make everything ready to go, and that's the key to making it go faster. This is the same motors that's just, they've taken the system and made it in, in a better operating condition to go. Things like the programmable VCUs now, these can be designed to have cooling modes. You could have a car cooling mode that's just, I'm commuting, and you're just sort of keeping it in the window or you could have a performance cooling mode where you're always trying to run the temperatures at their bare minimum so that they always have the biggest headroom if you're going to get spirited on it. Now, uh, that's now, something that wasn't available in the future uh, in the industry before. Now I know like a lot of that for the ludicrous mode and all that and the Teslas, a lot of it is like uh, the, the technology for the contactors. Like uh, they went to Inconel and all these super high heat resistant alloys. Yeah. And, in the contactors, and then that's what allows them to do a lot of that. Yeah, there but and you guys do current management for the contactors, right? Yes, yeah. The VCUs are set up to control the current. That that what, what a contactor is. I guess you should back up. A contactor is essentially a relay, except it's a really big relay. A giant it could, relay. It's a giant right? relay. It could have 800 volts on it, and it could be switching 1500 amps. Uh, it it it's controlling energy equivalent to what like a MIG welder would be doing. So if you were to try and do it wrong, they, they can very easily weld themselves closed. And once that happens, you know, that, that's very unsafe. And then so, controlling that with the AEM unit is one of the, the secrets to like performance, right? Well, yeah, you want to make sure that these systems are actually operated properly and safely. So controlling the contactors and controlling what they have is called a pre-charge resistor, Running that intelligently, watching it as it's pre-charging, you know how long it's supposed to take, you can tell that it started at a low voltage, it's coming up, you know when you can safely close these contactors, it's not gonna cause any problems. You can also identify failed components just by watching the characteristics as you turn these things on and you bring the power up in the car. That's the sort of thing that a vehicle control unit, an overall watchdog controller can see that when you have these things separately, you really wouldn't, you'd miss things like that and then you could end up with a really unsafe situation where you think you've turned off the power, you think the, the battery voltage is down, but you're still fully charged, which is really dangerous. And, and a lot of it's safety related too, like let's say you wreck, and then um, the, the system could like shut down properly and safely, right? Absolutely, it will, it will shut down safely, but more importantly is if it doesn't shut down safely, if you do get a welded contactor because of the accident, the ECU will know that the contactor has been told to go off but it will see that the voltages are still present where they're not supposed to be present. So it actually turns on the safety output. And you've seen those in some of the racing series, basically a go, no go light. You can actually turn on an indicator that says this car is not safe. It is still fully charged. The voltages are present, so you have to be very careful. Uh, another feature that, that's in the VCU that's kind of a core item uh, that you know a lot of these, these race cars or the, the, the corner, the, the garage built cars don't have, but they really should have because you don't want somebody to get hurt. Right, and I mean, I know from being involved with Formula Drift with the electric car, uh, like a lot of tracks don't even allow that car to run because the uh, safety workers, fire and safety, are, they're really afraid of the car. Uh, yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of education that has to go into it because if you don't know any better and you just run up to it and you think, well, the engine's not running, it must be safe. If you look for fire, there's no fuel spilling out, it must be safe. So there, there's education that has to be, has to be uh, given to a lot of these track, track personnel. Uh, some of this is obvious, you know, in this case you see orange. Whenever you see an EV, you see a lot of orange. Orange means high voltage. It means don't, don't cut this, you know. <laughs> this is not something you want to cut because you may find 800 volts on the inside of this thing. So 
it, it can be handled very safely with just a little bit of education and a lot of the, the features that are built into this are to identify if something's not right. They're to identify if you have a ground fault where maybe the chassis is grounded to the high voltage battery when it's not supposed to be or the fact that the battery is still powered up or the contactors are closed even though they've been told to not be closed. So these are all failure modes that can be identified the system can display it, works with all of our dash products, so you can have a huge warning on the, on the dash that just pops up that says high voltage, you know, no touch. You can, you can do things like that with a fully programmable system now where if you just piecemeal the things together without a supervisory controller, you don't really get the benefit of that. So I guess maybe, like a lot of people think that electric stuff is lame and they think of Priuses and uh, lame stuff like that. Why don't you briefly explain how badass this is? Well, this, this thing is actually really cool. This, this motor right here, this is an 840 horsepower motor. This car behind us has got two of them in there. It's got an 840 for the rear, and then it's got a half of one of them to drive the front. It's a four-wheel drive car. Makes 1,350 horsepower, only weighs 3,300 pounds, I believe. Ran Pikes Peak in the unlimited class. And you know this is not a crazy car. This ran in the unlimited class took second overall in the unlimited class and ran on the mountain in the nine minute range. Ran under sub 10 minutes. And that's just insane. You know, you, you get that kind of performance from cars that, that are way over 2,000 horsepower. It's just, it's crazy. And, and they're a lot of fun too. And you could deliver the horsepower and torque in like milliseconds, right? Oh, it's instant. And in fact, it's so instant that that's one of the challenges of an EV, is as soon as you have an actual high horsepower EV, you've got to really introduce some method to slow it down, some method to kind of roll the power in slightly. Uh, otherwise, you just, just tires come right off. You just blow the tires off and they're gone. Uh, and you can't actually go fast. You really need to be able to have torque, you know, torque mapping so that you can actually go as fast as you can go and run it right on the edge of what the tires can do every single time. And once you program that in, it'll do it again and again and again and again. So there's no turbo lag and there's no coming on the camera, nothing. It's just right there, right yeah. now. Yeah, you go up and you stage and you just have your finger on the button and your car's not popping, you're not screaming, nothing's happening and then you just release the button and yep. party's on. <laughs> no launch control, no nothing, right? Well, it's got fully programmed launch control, but there's nothing that you have to do that's truly uh, uh, obnoxious. You know, most launch controls, you see the car's sitting there and it's shaking and the motor's screaming and it's... Yeah, not it, launch uh, control in the way that us not, old not people Not in the way that you're to, used right? to seeing it. What you really see is the car just comes up, sits there, you'll hear it running because the motor will generally be running at that point and then it'll just go. Uh, and it's impressive, super impressive. It's also kind of, obviously it's quiet, but it's also really, really neat to hear the tires because you hear all the individual tires just kind of grinding because they're all on just that level of slip that you normally never hear because the engine drowns it out, but you can hear all the individual tires just, just on the edge of what they can do. And that's, a, that's something you don't normally hear and it's really kind of neat. So for our crazy project, what we need to do is get like a 300 horsepower NAK motor, have it drive the front, put one of these pumps at the back, right? Then we go and smoke everybody, right? Uh, that, would be, that would be nuts. I personally want to get uh, an old CRX and do a front wheel drive version with a big motor. That would be, I think that would be hilarious and that would be, that would be the car for me. And it's totally doable with, uh, oh, yeah. with, with AEM. Yeah, that'd be fun. So there we go, everybody. AEM, first people to, to the market with uh, electric control. Uh, first people to the market with uh, electric drive trade. Like, uh, we got to think of something to do with all this stuff, right? Oh, yeah, it like totally kicks ass. And uh, this is one of the coolest things I've seen at the show. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Here we are at TurboSmart with the socially awkward engineer types. Uh, I'm really socially awkward and I hate talking in public and I really hate being in video. Like, right, Chris? Great news, me too, mate. <laughs> so, uh, we're gonna attempt to do a video here and uh, what we're looking at is probably my favorite product of the entire show. We wanted to cover this at SEMA, but we ran out of time. Uh, what we got here is a electronically controlled wastegate. Uh, this is like a badass product and I think it's really a game changer. Uh, so what we have is a wastegate. Instead of being a pneumatic actuator, it's actually electrical, and it can be direct ECU control. So you don't have the hysteresis or the lag 
of having another thing in the control loop. Like you can get your ECU, control your boost directly. Uh, you can be really creative. You can like uh, go by shaft speed. Uh, you can go by uh, GPS position. You can integrate with traction control. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that blows my mind. And I got Chris here and he's gonna explain how this works, what's the mechanics behind it, and uh, yeah, uh, what do you say? I'll, I'll try and do my best. So um, effectively what we've done is taken the Gen 5 wastegate range, which released, uh, what, two years ago now, and that's officially when the development probably started the electronic side. We, are, we already had the mechanical side buttoned up and we knew we had a really reliable high-flowing gate, then we needed to take it to the next level. So the electronic actuator range, like the Gen 5 stuff, is, is modular. So although mm -hmm. we've released a 45 and a 60, it will go on the other housings if need be, depending on demand. Um, we'll talk about the straight gate in a minute because that's a, that's a different ball game. But in terms of the electronic actuator, um, it's different to what you'd see in an OEM application, which is starting to come out in that it's got a lot more grunt, for want of a better word, and there's some, there's some features and benefits. The secret source is literally in the gearbox that's, mm -hmm. in, that's, in, the, 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 that's in the housing. So it's, it's an offset servo motor. You've got a, a, an electrical motor, which um, uh, is on one side of the unit. You've got a gearbox that's directly controlled to the valve itself. Um, uh, the, the unique feature of it um, is actually zero back drive. So we've tested it over 300 PSI. You can't physically overcome the valve and the gearbox setup. Um, it'll not physically lift the valve, uh, even with that much pressure. The key to that is it does it with zero current demand, um, which overall makes for a much more stronger valve, or a, a stronger valve, but also one that um, uh, is gonna overall use a lot less current and be a lot more controllable. And I, I think like the motor gives a wider adjustable range, because like probably a lot of our viewers we're probably thinking that this is like a pulse width modulated solenoid kind of thing, but it's actually a motor, and, and the motor has like a lot more gross movement and. Uh 100%, it's, it's actually what they, well you control it on what they consider a H-bridge circuit. So it's very similar to actually an electronic throttle by and how it works. You've got full drive backwards and forwards. We are supplying it as is what we consider a dumb gate in that it's, there's five wires hanging out of it. it. It doesn't have a lot going on, you just tell it what to do. But equally it's got a feedback, uh, so like a sensor output on it to tell you where the position is with really high resolution actually. Um, but from a, um, from a, a, a torque point of view, it's actually torque is increased by the gearbox and yeah, it really gets the job done. Um, like some of our uh, viewers are probably going to be worried about uh, heat and, and all that with the uh, electronics. Now, what have you guys done to address the heat issue? Well, there's there's a couple of different things. Number one, it is um, liquid cooled. So you've got engine uh, coolant and potentially even engine oil if you need to maintain consistency. But what's important to point out from a wastegate point of view, traditionally heat is an issue because you've got a diaphragm. Now, a diaphragm is something that doesn't matter where you get your wastegate from, somewhere between about 280 and 300 degrees C, it's going to liquefy, it's going to fail on you. Um, and all the effort traditionally has been put into making that diaphragm last longer. There is no diaphragm. There's no spring um, to not work over a bunch of heat cycles. There's no hoses to fall off. None of that's all gone. You would argue it's actually a more robust unit. Uh, we've gone to the effort to learn actually how to make the gears and the gearboxes ourselves. It's all metal. The weak point's actually the solder on the rotary encoder. You've got to melt the solder for this type of problem. And this might seem like a dumb question, but you could probably actually get the water from your throttle body uh, de-icer to uh, keep the wastegate cool, right? Absolutely, you just got to maintain consistency. And the reason that we liquid cool, it's important to point out, um, it's actually the magnets in the motor that we're concerned about. So magnets did tend to demagnetize um, at around 180 degrees C, um, and you want to actually keep it below that to maintain consistency and control. It's the main reason the cooling's there. Shoot, I did not know that about the magnets, really. Yeah, so it's an important process. We wanted a product that was gonna work in just about any environment. If it changed for whatever reason, the boost control strategy had to change because of heat, then it, it, it wasn't the product that we wanted to release. I mean, what I find intriguing is, uh, you know like how we've been involved in Pikes Peak a lot lately, mm -hmm. and you know like how turbine shaft speed is always an issue as you climb up, and uh, I mean, I think we could manage the boost purely by shaft speed, and uh, the, this thing will just maintain the shaft speed. 100%, and it's actually quite exciting and interesting from our point of view. Um, the ECU guys and the guys doing the calibration are going to come up with their own unique ways of keeping things together. As you say, it's not necessarily about boost. Uh, pike speak and diesels especially, it's about shaft speed. You just want the thing to hold together, especially with compound servos. Like, between, you know, between uh, your, your layers of boost there, like, Nobody really cares what's going on. It's about holding the thing together. And if, you've, if your strategy is complex enough, you can definitely make that work. Yeah, you just keep this thing in the fat part of the map. 100%, yeah. Uh, and then uh, with traction control, 
with getting rid of the pneumatics and all that, getting rid of the hysteresis, I mean, you could have the traction control like really in a tight loop. A hundred percent. And what's interesting, well, what, what I found really cool is that with a traditional pneumatic style setup, you're always, it's a response. Something's happening because something's happening. You've, you've got a boost, it's, the diaphragm's moving around because boost increased or you moved it. That's the, the basis of reference-based boost control. Um, you can actually predict with this. If, if you know what your car's doing and the strategy is imperative enough, important enough, you can actually tell the gate to be where it needs to be before you even get to the problem and you can solve it before you get there. And one thing that I always wanted to try is like a lot of times you might get a small turbo for the best response, but then uh, you get up on the boost and you're holding it there with your pneumatic control, but then your back pressure starts going up mm -hmm. and, and it starts getting in the choke. And I think with this wastegate, you could actually probably map it to where you get the turbo where you want, then you could actually start to open the gate to reduce your back pressure. And that's a whole level of tuning that I don't think anybody's ever addressed. I, I agree, and look, we, we've already spoken to a number of guys that have spoken to us at here, SEMA, and even in the in the weeks in between, um, they're looking to actually model the gate and then model their turbos, and it's it's an electronic model that'll go into the system, and you're just de dialing in efficiency. Uh, I, you know, like it's a whole new way of thinking about how to do it, and uh, man, I really want to mess around with this stuff. Yeah, look, it, and we're excited to see everybody play with it, you know what I mean? And, and that's the thing, we want to get them um, used to the, the control strategy for the poppet style valve. It, I consider it somewhat of a gateway drug because once you get your head around that, you're going to love the straight gate. Uh, and this is a really innovative product too, the, the straight gate. Yeah, look, we. This is probably, from our point of view, the one that we were most excited about, but we know we needed to nail the poppet style gate first. Now, the reason we're excited about this is you've got a smaller, lighter product that'll effectively flow more and give you a lot more linear boost control, so a lot more finite control, especially around the initial opening stage. Uh, and, and yeah, this is like one of the first products like this uh, that, that's probably reliable on the market. Uh, we believe so. Look, the, um, the cool thing about it, it's, it, you've really got to rethink your engine bay, and, that, and that's going to be the, the, the hard point for some people to get their head around. The people that get it are already got it, and they're looking for creative ways to use it, but, but ultimately you've lost all the inefficiency of getting gas to, to, to turn 90 degrees. Um, the, uh, the way that a poppet-style valve works, regardless of how good your control is, when it initially lifts off the seat, there's quite a high change in airflow. Um, with uh, a straight-style gate, you can actually have a really, really small change, so it's a lot linear control. You've got a 50 mil valve here effectively that outflows the best 60 on the market by almost 30 percent um, and it's smaller and lighter and by the time we come to market with this next year we're actually going to work on packaging to use a smaller motor as well because it uses less current to get the job done. And then I think like uh, for you that want to do this I mean you have like internal wastegate, external various sizes and this model I mean it's a lot of flexibility and I, I can't wait to start playing with this. Oh yeah, we're, we're excited to get it on the market. I, I, I can't lie, the, the IWG actuator, so the internal wastegate actuator was a, it's not the right product just yet, but we did it because we could. We've got to downside the motor. There's a bit of an internal joke. If you actually sent that gate home without thinking about what you're doing with electronics, you'd probably bend the flat because it's got the same motor as one of the pop-up style ones. But again, we'll reduce the size of the motor when we do the straight gate development. We'll wind that across into the actuator setup and we'll provide the solution across the, the whole range. So here we go. The latest badass stuff from TurboSmart. Can't wait to start playing with this stuff. I think this is really a game changer. Probably the most exciting product of the PRI show. And uh, thank you for putting up with us socially awkward engineers talking about board crap. But uh, uh, you know, I, I know you didn't want to do this, but I, I think you did great. <laughs> Appreciate it, Mike. It's, it's great having you by. I've always been a fan. Cheers, mate. Greetings again from the 2019 PRI show. I'm here in the S1 sequential booth. Um, as many of you remember, Project SE300, we recently did a T56 transmission swap, which is an excellent uh, six-speed gearbox from Tremec. But uh, it's still kind of an H pattern. And what we actually have here is uh, a company that's manufactured a bolt-on shifter replacement for the T56 that turns it into a sequential unit. So forward and backwards for up and down. Uh, it, it, it's a really neat setup because it works for all of the different T56s. For us, I believe we have a T56 Agnum on our car, but there's the XL and there's all these different variants of T56 that are commonly used in swaps. And so I'm greeted here by Simon, or with Simon, um, from S1. It's nice to see you, thanks for being here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this newer version of the sequential mount and maybe something about the gear indicator? 
Yeah, okay, this is our latest version out. We've had these out for about a month. It's for the remote mount shifters you'd find used in late model Camaros, a lot of, almost every car after 2005. Yeah, okay. Um, the main conversion using unit bolts on the top of the gearbox and it runs linkages back to the shifter. Okay, really cool. And then so how does the uh, gear indicator work? Is it just the analog voltage signal or? Yeah, okay, from that we've got an analog signal from a Hall effect sensor on the side here. Okay. And that just runs through and gets interpreted by the gear, the gear display. Oh, excellent. So if you have an ECU that can accommodate a voltage input to gear ratio translation, you can actually use that for part of the yeah. sequential setup and blip shift and things like that? Yeah, definitely. And also if you've got a Helltech dash, something like that, you can display it up there. Oh, excellent. This is really, really cool. We hope to maybe get one on Project SC300 and do <laughs> a, a feature on the install. But uh, thanks yep. very much for your time. I right. uh, hope Thank you have you. a great show. Thanks. So if you're a Moto IQ reader, you know all about Professional Awesome. You know uh, Dan here. He, he, you know Dan here. He writes for Moto IQ a lot, and uh, you know all about the Professional Awesome Evo. And here it is in the flesh. It's rebuilt. It's badass. And uh, you want to take us around it a bit? Yeah. Well, we can start with the uh, engine since it's exposed right now. We've got a 4G64 with an Evo 9 Myvec cylinder head. Makes about 750 wheel horsepower. Uh, Garrett Turbo, dry sump. Um, we've been working with Wayland Speed um, R&D to um, build the engine and make it as reliable as possible because that's kind of the issue with these unlimited builds. 750 wheel horsepower um, on a circuit is uh, tough to keep alive. Yeah, and the uh, dry sump helps a lot, right? The dry sump, um, a daily's dry sump was a big improvement. Um, we were having all sorts of catch can issues with the wet sump before. You would see dips in the, the oil pressure, and with the dry sump, all those problems were gone. Now, I know with the 4G, a lot of times cylinder head uh, sealing is an issue. What did you do to address that? So this year, um, with Wayland's recommendation, we went with an O-ring in the cylinder block, and um, we're using an MLS gasket with that. And um, we will hopefully find out at our next event how well it worked. But so far, with his testing, it's um, on, on his vehicles, it's worked extremely well. Uh, what, what Garrett Turbo are you running? We're using a GTX 3582R Gen 2. And uh, what wastegate? Uh, Turbo Smart wastegates. All right. And uh, so you're running a tall deck block. And are you running the stock 4G stroke? We are actually using a D-stroke 4G64 crank. So it's a 94 millimeter crank from Manly, and we're using a slightly longer rod, 156 millimeter rod. So a tall deck, log rod, so you're trying to reduce your piston speed. Exactly, we're trying to reduce uh, loading on the, the sides of the uh, cylinder walls and um, keep this thing alive. We actually don't even rev it out that high, about 7,500 RPM, and it, all in the name of reliability. And, and like what you're doing is the way like I would probably build one of these motors too. And, uh, so you did it first, now I can copy you at that way, Spuddy. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, that's we learned from you, we learned from Kim and all the other Moto IQ riders about how to uh, keep engines alive. Reliability is the most important. If you're not on track uh, and you're in the pits fixing it, you're not going to win. So uh, I think Professional Awesome is kind of known for their uh, aerodynamics innovation, right? Yeah. So what kind of stuff have you done here? I'll let Mike speak on the aero a bit because he's kind of our aero engineer. Yeah. So. So really our whole thing is our DIY downforce and our, our making uh, aerodynamic components work for affordably for everybody, right? So um, you'll see we have a, a wood splitter here. It's got our large diffusers in it, which you can find on our website. Um, but really the whole point is to make um, as much downforce simplistically as possible. So this is a flat splitter, but it's got diffusers behind it. It's made out of wood, which is different than most unlimited class cars. And then a lot of simple touches like sealing off the front end and then a smaller inlet for the intercooler here because the radiator's in the rear in this car, but just the smallest inlet that we can get away with so that we don't get too much air into the engine bay and then have to release that air. You try to build up all the uh, stagnation pressure up right. in the front, right? Right, yeah, so the air dam helps with the stagnation pressure. So we get a lot of uh, that, that front air dam effect and then we also get a lot of effect from our diffusers, um, uh, our off-the-shelf diffusers, so it really works well. And, and reasonably, this car in this configuration um, has tremendous aero load and, and keeps up with most of the other cars in the United States in terms of aero turns and aero speeds. Uh, have you used CFD to develop the aero package of this car? So little uh, pieces and parts of it have been CFD'd, but this whole entire car as, as it sits has not. So our, our large diffusers that are in the splitter that we sell have been CFD'd. Our, our fender vents that we sell have been CFD'd, but the car as a whole has not. 
one of the things I wanted to state too is that with Professional Awesome, you can actually go to their website and buy a lot of this stuff. And it's all stuff that, uh, you know, you would spend a lot of money making, but it's right there on the shelf, right? right. Exactly, and that's the point. We're all about build it yourself, but we're trying to make it affordable. So a lot of our parts are, are made from a, a, an ABS uh, type plastic. Um, so it's a little bit more affordable than buying carbon options, which are drastically more expensive, but they have a ton of engineering in them. We did a ton of CFD, we test them ourselves. Obviously we use them on our own cars to prove that they work. And uh, that's our whole goal is just to make aerodynamics affordable for everybody. So uh, what kind of suspension do you have on this car? So we have a, a Fortune Auto three-way kit. Um, it's their Dreadnought series, and, and it's fantastic for us. Um, it's, it's actually not sprung as heavily as other cars, so it's a, right now it's 13K front and 15K rear. Um, we use progressive bump stops to handle the aero loads, and uh, that really works out really well for us. It's actually kind of compliant, it's soft, so we get really good mechanical grip, but once it gets on the bump stops, we have really good control of the car, chassis control for the aerodynamics. So that's how you uh, deal with pitch sensitivity and stuff. Exactly, since the car, um, would be pitch sensitive due to the aero components and such. The bump stops, the progressive bump stops, really control that body and really give us the best effects possible. With, with the Fortunes too, we use a lot of compression damping and that keeps the car off the ground with, we reduce um, rebound damping so it allows it to spring back quickly so that way we don't um, load the car and then it stays down low with too much rebound damping that can be very common with other uh, manufacturers. So uh, do you tune it with like packers, they have the bump stops and stuff? So most of the time what we do is um, there's different bump stop heights that we actually have. So we actually have different types for them, for them and we don't actually use the packers. We haven't had to, but we take the whole suspension apart, you know, take the springs off of it and then do our testing to see where um, those uh, uh, bump stops end up so that we always get ourselves basically in the perfect position about an inch off the ground or three quarters of an inch off the ground for basically full compression where the progressive bump stops basically go to the moon. And uh, so you guys have like a real transaxle in your car with like uh, like a real motorsports one. You want to explain some of that? Sure. Yeah. So we uh, we're using um, a, a Drenth sequential in this car, um, primarily because um, we honestly we were on the the stock box for a really long time, and John at TRE builds some amazing things, but. Once you do this, you just can't keep those alive. The fourth gear, especially any of those, won't stay alive. So the Drenth sequential that we have in this is fantastic. Um, you know, really fast shifts, easy up and down shifts, and then um, basically we, we haven't had a problem, can't break it. So that's that's the best part about it. Uh, what kind of differentials and uh, what do you got going in your transfer case? So we have the, the front diff is an ATS, the center is a, um, a uh, quaif, and then the rear is a 12 plate by John at TRE. That's pretty awesome. Uh, what, do you, what are you doing about engine management? So right now we've got the uh, AM Infinity. So the Infinity controls everything. We also have their CAN Expander and, and their EGT um, expansion module and those types of things so that we have uh, a bunch of information so we know exactly what's going on at any given time. So if we lose a cylinder, we see it. We have, um, we have uh, pressure sensors in the coolant. We also have block pressure sensors, back pressure sensors so we know how well the turbo is working, turbo speed, all those things to really make sure we know the health of that engine. And you know, like one of the reasons why I wanted to feature this car is, I mean, it's really badass and it looks crazy, but this is actually a pretty obtainable car. Oh, oh, very much so. And so, like, what I tell people is that this splitter, if you were to build it yourself, buy it, um, buy all the parts for it, is about five hundred and fifty dollars total, and then you just build it yourself to fit your car. Five hundred and fifty dollars runs with the fastest cars in the country. That's got to tell you something right there. And for the whole rest of the package, besides the, uh, besides that wing, all the rest of the materials to build it probably cost us maybe a thousand bucks total, and we just put it together in a smart way to try to get as much advantage as possible. And, and none of our, our ideas are secret. We're willing to work and talk with anybody, explain how we do it. Nothing is, nothing is sacred. We're yeah. willing to help out other folks. 100%. You can go on our website. We've got a bunch of information about DIY Downforce. We've got our YouTube videos about DIY Downforce. We're just trying to help people learn. So like a lot of the hard aero stuff, you can buy it from Professional Awesome right off the shelf. You could uh, talk to them about setting it up, and uh, it's really cool. Arrow is like a really kind of a voodoo thing, but they make it simple. They're bringing it to the consumer, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we're featuring this car. Uh, thank you, guys, and pretty badass. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Have a good show. You too, man. We will. We're continuing our coverage of the PRI show about things that I think are cool anyway, and everybody in the industry kind of knows me as a suspension guy, and of course, KW is one of the companies I work with the most. And they, they're coming out with some really cool stuff. Some of their stuff is uh, solid piston technology. 
and uh, the five-way adjustable damper. Now, uh, we got Chris here. A lot of you guys know who Chris is. Uh, he's like kind of a famous dude. And we got Thomas. And are you guys uh, willing to explain a little bit about solid piston and five-way? Okay. So basically, two years ago, we launched a four-way uh, damper, solid piston damper with an external reservoir. And this year, we're launching the damper with the inline reservoir. It's five-way, so it got low speed uh, rebound, low speed bump, and high speed bump and high speed rebound, and uh, a blow-off adjustment. The blow-off adjustment is cutting the high speed, and it's adjustable on what point it's set it up. Um, I, I guess like what uh, or maybe people don't understand is what the fifth adjustment is. So typically your compression curve, uh, even if you're adjusting the high speed, will continue to climb, right? Exactly. And uh, so what this does is it enables you to like kind of roll off the high speed so it'll stay more linear once you get your blow off, right? Exactly. You, the tendency is in high speed damping that you're actually going to a really steep curve and then later on when the forces are getting too big, you just cut it off. And, and, uh, and that's mainly better for high bumps and curb strike. Right. What do you think, Chris? Yes. Yes. Uh, I guess another innovation is the solid piston, right? Like uh, traditionally you're trying to do your uh, low speed control with very little fluid volume. And uh, so you're talking about high operating pressure, small, um, small orifices to get the control with so little fluid flow, but with the solid piston, you have a, a lot more volume to get the control force, right? Exactly. Basically, the car is standing on a high oil vo volume, 35 millimeter piston diameter. So that's um, the, the oil where you're standing on and you push all the oil through the valves, which uh, gives you the opportunity that you don't have to balance the valve anymore against the piston. So full control and better damping and lower operating pressures. Uh, lower pressure, lower temperature, less lag in the valves, but right? St but still higher forces. Right, and I, I guess if you don't understand like how shocks work, I mean, typically you're trying to control your high speed with only like a few tablespoons of oil flow, and now you have like almost the whole entire volume of the shock body. Exactly. Um, that's basically also bringing down your response time. So you have the best damping from the first millimeter on, and you don't have to wait until your shims uh, are there and then working on the valve. So you're working on the valve directly. So what do you have to say, Chris? Yes. Yes. So uh, we're really excited to try these new KW products. We're going to be doing it on, on drift cars, time attack cars, and uh, we'll be writing all about it and how to set it up and how to use it. Can't wait. Yes, me as well. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Yes. So you know we're a big fan of radium. They always have badass stuff, products to make fueling your car a lot easier. And we got Jeremy here. He's going to go over some of the new stuff for this year. And since I own the GTR, I really want to get some of this GTR stuff. Why don't you uh, break it down? Yeah, so for this uh, next year, we're going to have our new product line for the GTR R35 stuff. One of them is this um, fuel pump hanger. So this can do up to three pumps. You can run like an AEM pump. You can run a, a Walbro 255 or even the new brushless e E5 LM pump um, that you can get from TI Automotive or maybe Injector Dynamics in the next couple months. It uses, uh, still retains a factory crossover for the uh, Venturi jet pumps inside the tank. Because so it's a saddle tank, It right? is a saddle tank, yeah. So um, it's all driven off of the high pressure side of the fuel pumps rather than the return side. So the, there's never going to be any restriction on the return side of the fuel system. Saddle tanks are a big pain in the ass, and it's uh, really cool that you're addressing that like in a real positive manner, better than OEM. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're trying to keep fuel starvation to a minimum, so um, it, because it uses the Venturi still, and it also uses a little one-way check valve at the bottom, this thing's always going to be maintained with fuel at all times. Um, how about some of the stuff with the terminals and stuff on top? So, uh, in the past, we used to use uh, electrical CPC connectors, but uh, over time, these pumps are drawing more and more current, so... Uh, 
they get to be hot. It ends up being like epoxy problems, so we end up just changing over to these stainless steel studs. And these things are bulletproof. They'll take you know anything way over 50 amps of current. So it's never going to be an issue with the with the terminals now. How about some of the plumbing? Uh, so the plumbing is tricky on the GTR. Um, we're going to have the kit so you can reuse the factory stock fuel lines, but you can also run uh, a, our fuel plumbing kit for it, which will include 2-6 lines that feed all the way to the front of the car through our fuel filter. This is really sweet. I mean, I, I am so going to get one of these for my, uh, especially I'm going to be running E85, so I'm going to need to handle a pretty good volume of fuel. And uh, this is a drop-in solution. I don't have to figure nothing out. It'll go right in. Yeah. I, I kind of like that. I, I don't like figuring things out. <laughs> well, uh, one thing to keep in mind is those brushless pumps that Injector Dynamics is coming out with, they'll flow 1,200 liters per hour with one pump. And if you wanted to, you could do up to three of them. So you're never going to have a problem with uh, the, uh, the amount of flow you can give the engine with this system. So uh, everybody knows that I'm a sucker for punishment and I like Subarus. So what, what do you got for Subarus? Uh, so this year we released a new TGV Delete housing. Um, the reason why this one is unique is this one actually do dual ports per cylinder. Um, but it also, this TGV will work on a stock Subaru with the factory fuel lines and everything like that. It's very modular. Um, so it's got big old Dash 10 fuel lines on the front and the rear. Um, Cerakoted black. And then we also have a, this is like a raw finish, a little cheaper version. So if you're going to run methanol yeah. or whatever to keep your Subaru from blowing up, yeah. uh, this is the thing. With right. The, I mean, now that you have Subarus making over 1,000 horsepower, so you're going to need more injectors. 1,000 horsepower for a very little while. Yeah. <laughs> the other exciting product is now you make your own fuel cells, right? Yes. Uh, starting this next year, we're going to be having 10-gallon uh, fuel cells, 15-gallon, and then we'll start making more cells, uh, different sizes as uh, time goes on and get more and more requests. And they have uh, your F FCST? Yeah, you can uh, get them with our FCST or you can use any plate that uh, the major companies, Fuel Safe, ATL, like, uh, companies like that make drop-in units. Um, this one specifically is FIA certified, so if you have you know, any sanctioning body that requires FIA homologation, you can run this cell. And, and what I've always liked about your system is your surge tank, all your pumps and everything is integrated right into here. It's a lot cleaner, a lot safer. You don't have all that crap like uh, that could get detached in an accident. Um, <laughs> it's it's this is the way to go, I think. Yeah, and uh, this one specifically, you can do two brushless fuel pumps. So, uh, like the thing we like to say about brushless fuel pumps, you get you get pretty much twice the amount of flow, half the current of a normal brush pump. Um, and you also have like a quick fill too, right? We do. We have uh, dry brakes now, so if you need to do quick filling on pit stops, um, we have a dump can in this dry brake system. Um, so that's another option for yeah. some. And, and it's really awesome to, to be able to fill a tank in like seconds literally. Yeah, absolutely. And no spilling or anything weird either. Yes. Um, so this is a really exciting product. Now, uh, Radium is like your one-stop fuel system company, right? Yes. And uh, uh, I can't wait to use some of these products in some of our projects, too. Yes, one other thing about this cell I'll say is it is polyethylene bladder, so you can run any type of fuels, ethanol, methanol, E85, gasoline, race gas, anything you want. But the popularity of E85, uh, that's, that's a great thing, too. And, uh, you know, like a lot of people, the bladder messes up, the foam messes up, but they switch to alcohol, but th this is ready to go, right? Absolutely. Cool. So here we go for radium this year. Exciting stuff. Can't wait to try it out. The cool product of the PRI show is Link. Link is a uh, ECU. We've been using it in some of our projects. What's new for Link? What's new for Link? So we've just developed the G4X range. It's the successor of the G4 Plus. Has a new processor, all new hardware inside, with upgraded I.O. and upgraded comms. What's better about the processor? The new processor is 32-bit floating point capable, so all the math is high resolution and high speed natively. Um, there is a hardware coprocessor for engine timing, so there's no compromise on math processing versus engine timing. So no jitter involved with any kind of additional processing that we need for other functions, such as uh, control over body functions. Uh, boost control and all that sort of thing. So it's uh, super stable then, and like it, you don't have like the 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 values not being what you entered, like you see sometimes. No, that's right. It is stable. It's all oriented to getting the engine to run with 
completely stable timing, basically, and everything else functioning at the same time in parallel. Uh, so are these are these new ECUs on the market right now? Yeah, yep. So we've released the Atom and the Monsoon first up. Um, they're available now. We will release the Storm in about two weeks, and subsequently we'll release the Fury and the Extreme within about eight weeks' time. So. So I'm bummed. I got my car running all awesome on Link, and now you've come out with better stuff. Ah, uh, yeah. No, that's cool. You can always put your old ECU on uh, on eBay or something like that, and just get a new one. It's all good. Uh, and I, I've been really impressed with the Link ECU. Like normally, it's hard to beat the drivability of the uh, stock ECU, but the, the Link is amazing. Oh yeah. No, we've added things like asynchronous in injection and timing stability improvements. So you should see smoother, more responsive, I mean seriously more responsive tunes, like straight out of the box. So, so that's Link for this year, pretty exciting stuff. So we're here at the Honda Ata booth with Chris and his sweet little Tacoma truck, the K24 swap, and it caught my eye because obviously, me being a Honda person, I'm obviously going to gravitate towards this. No offense to anything else here, but uh, Chris, how did this come about, how did this whole chassis, this uh, we, uh, me and my, my partner, we have, uh, he, he started out racing a uh, Toyota pickup truck with a, a 2JZ in it, and uh, when they were, when he was building it, uh, I used to race front wheel drive. Okay. So I kept breaking transmissions, break transmissions, breaking transmissions, so uh, th with this, we, we got a guy in uh, Ohio, Bill Hencher, he made an adapter plate to, to adapt the K24 into the uh, K24 to a power glide. Oh, nice. Well, so that, that did away with my transmission issues, but when we was doing, uh, the, the motor, the engine management, like for the Toyota, it was like uh, $3,500. Oh. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I seen that, that Honda offered an ECU that like, it works great for us. Uh, and like a quarter of the price, I think it's like for the ECU and everything, it's like $900 for the ECU with, with software. You know what nice. I mean? So $900 compared to like $35,000, $4,000. Okay. And uh, so it, the software worked great for me and it, uh, we've been 805 with it. So like everybody else like racing like the class I race I race with a bunch of like front wheel drive guys and stuff, and they're running like seven ninety eight zero and the like their soft engine software and stuff is just like the Motec best of the best of the best yeah. expensive expensive. Not saying that Honda is not the best of the best. It, it works great for me. So uh, yeah, we're going in January. We're hoping to go to uh, Bradenton. We're, we're hoping to go seven uh, go sevens on the uh, the Honda software. Okay. So what's what's this setup? It's a straight K24. Okay. So it's got a manly turbo tough rods in the in the bottom end, J pistons. Okay. Uh, uh, factory ported head, no 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 aftermarket port. Um, Super Tech valve springs, retainers, nice. and valves. Uh, that's pretty much it. It's, nice. it's it, the motor is really simple. And what's the rear end like? Uh, it's got a four nine inch rear end in it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, fabric. It's a fabricated housing. Uh, the transmission is a GM Power Glide from FTI. So, nice. Yeah. It's. A bunch of American parts with a, with a Japanese engine. It works, right? Yeah, Switch it works great. Holds works. the power yep. and yep. everything. So who did this uh, manifold here? Is it uh, CD Fab? CD Fab. That's okay. my shop. Me and my buddy's nice. shop. We, uh, I do all the fabricating. Um, my buddy Joe Fisher does all the tuning. Cool. Paris Jacobs and Beagle, uh, they do all the wiring. And uh, Beagle helps with the fabrication. Uh, Chad's our guy at the track. He, he lines us up, keeps us, keeps us straight when we're going down the track. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's our, that's our crew, that, and that's CD Fab. Uh, turbo size, last thing. Turbo size, 62. Uh, is it 62 millimeter? Nice. Yeah, and uh, IPG Parts is the company that we buy all of our parts from for for all the fabrication and all like the engine parts and stuff. We go straight through IPG Parts, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And one last thing. Uh, this is still registered, and yeah. you still drive this yeah, on the Yeah, still registered, and uh, yeah, still registered plates, insurance, ins uh, inspection. Uh, last last week before we came here, we we did a uh, 200 mile. Round trip, we did a, a thing called Toys for Tots, okay. where uh, we all collected at our shops, and uh, we ended up donating like around like nine thousand dollars worth of toys. And like, moral of the story, we, we took the toys, we, we loaded this with trailers and other vehicles, and we uh, we drove it 100, 100 miles one way and uh, another hundred miles back. So we did no hiccups. Trip. No hiccups. Yeah, it was fine. Yep. That's reliability for yep. you. Well, thank you, Chris, yep. for doing this interview. I appreciate Sweet it. truck and. Thank you. Here at the CSF booth, another car that caught our eye is this 135i Dragster. 
Obviously, you take a look at the skinnies on here. That is really what makes this car stand out. Not very often that you see BMW drag cars. We're also here with the owner of the vehicle and builder, Gassan, from Gassan Automotive, and he's going to help give us a little rundown of the car. Um, so, Gassan, uh, maybe we can even start by, first off, talking about the engine setup that we got here and sure. what went into the build. Sure. So, we did a lot of R&D with this car. We actually started with a stock motor, completely factory unknown, sealed motor, and we actually got the world record with that motor. And the whole purpose of this car was us to do a lot of R&D and see where the limits are and uh, uh, take it to the next level. Um, we went with, like I said, you know, the stock motor and then eventually we put rods, pistons and studs and then essentially eventually went with the CSS uh, uh, closed deck modified uh, block with the O-rings or the fire rings. Uh, what CSS does is they machine out the open deck part of the uh, block and then press fit this uh, insert which, uh, you know, supports the top of the cylinder walls as well as they did also machine uh, O-rings on the block or fire rings, however you want to call them to help uh, seal the motor against head gasket failures and whatnot. Now, being an open deck block originally, obviously mm -hmm. all this open area was used for cooling. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that all these holes are built in there in order sure. to provide yeah. additional yeah. cooling for yeah. the walls. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is this is to help you know coolant flow through the insert piece, which um, you know a, a lot of people will sometimes have you know cooling issues um, once they do modify the box. However, we don't have any issues. The design from CSS grade and CSF radiators, I mean, you know, with the fan full on, I mean, it won't get past 165 degrees, you know, so we actually have to, you know, through the ECU, let the fan not kick on so we can actually get the engine to the temperature we need. Now, but you, so when you did it with the open deck block and then you ran it with this semi-closed mm -hmm. deck block, sure. no difference in temperatures? No, no. Not for us, at least. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Coming from a road racing background, that's a, it's, it's it's a little mind boggling because yeah. you know, obviously we're beating up on cars for yeah, 20, yeah, yeah, 30 yeah. minutes yeah. straight. No, we, well, we just take nine seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, maybe we can let's move over here sure. a little bit and we'll talk about some of the plumbing. Sure. Uh, let's go over the now since so we were talking about the heat management of the car. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the cooling package. So, um, the build had different stages, like we said. You know, we you know broke the record on the stock motor and then we wanted to take it to the next level and that's when you know most your off the shelf items didn't really help us and uh, we contacted a couple of vendors and uh, CSF uh, radiators they uh, they welcomed us and sponsored us by giving us their I believe king radiator system as well as their uh, core over here and ever since we switched to that I mean our intake temperature intake air temperatures are phenomenal and then the radiator, just like we spoke about before, I mean, coolant temps are perfect, okay. you know. Um, so being a turbo car, keeping those intake temps is very important. Very, then, very, I mean, you will see it. If you have a bad intercooler, you will see it spike past 160 degrees. You know, now we're seeing maybe 8, 9, 10 degrees above ambient, which is perfect. You know, that's hardly, hardly a pickup, you know, and you're compressing 40 plus pounds of boost. What engine management system is this running? So this vehicle is on the AM Infinity 506. Um, to make that swap happen, we did have to delete the direct injection, and um, yeah, it's it's been working great for us actually. What's what are you doing for fuel delivery? So fuel delivery, we got obviously in the back in the trunk, we got the Air Motor 50 uh, pump that they came out with a couple of years ago, I believe. Um, at this trade show, they came out with the 7.5 and the 10O, so twice the fuel delivery. But that fuel pump alone is good for 2,000 plus horsepower, so we're not going to need to upgrade anytime soon. Um, we got vibrant uh, stainless steel braided lines for the whole fuel system, and then Deech Works uh, 2200 cc injectors. We got two sets of those, so 12 injectors. Okay. So there's a total of four, 44. Yeah, are they CCs. staged or? No, they're, they're not staged currently. You know, um, the car is running on E100, so um, it'll idle just fine with you know both injectors. You know, at one percent duty cycle or something. <laughs> you know. Now, one thing that I noticed while just kind of looking over the engine bay is this rectangular thing on top of the intake manifold. Like, maybe you can explain to me exactly what's going on there. So, so that's a burst panel. Um, we actually, that's also another um, sponsored part by Plasma Man out of Australia. They're here at um, PRI as well. And um, we contacted them and uh, told them, hey, we need an intake manifold, and we optioned it out, and they delivered an amazing product. And, what that piece is is a burst panel in case you have a nitrous backfire, you know, possibly any other type of backfire, but usually it's for nitrous. 
and all it does is it's gonna you know blow you know that piece off rather than you know the whole intake or possibly you know cause some damage to the engine or so real life danger to the manifold valve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not, but right? hey, you know. Well, cool. If you guys want any more information on this, be sure to follow Hassan Kassan Automotive, and we'll be probably hoping bringing you more information on this build as well as it breaks more records. Sure, awesome. Right. Thanks, Thanks for your so time, much, man. Sir. Much Hi. appreciated. No problem. Hi, I'm Devin. I'm here with Moto IQ today at the Apex Pro booth. You may have read about my article when I talked about their new Apex Pro thing that they have that helps me manage my track data while I'm on track real time. And they came out with this new thing called the OBD interface. Here it is. And here we have Andrew here to talk about it. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, Andrew Rains with Apex Pro. Um, the Apex Pro device, like Devin was saying, it's a motorsports data acquisition system. It's simple, easy to use. We've spent a lot of time together learning how to go faster. Yeah. Spe specifically at Road Atlanta. But um, you can use it at your home track, wherever you're from. Um, and we recently launched the OBD2 interface. So now, not only can you get standalone data from the device, from the accelerometers in the device, but you can also get vehicle data. So you can monitor your coolant temperature, you can now see throttle position, RPM, and we even have a gear indication so you can find out what gear you're in around the track. I need that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It helps a lot, right? Because a lot of corners are between third and fourth gear in most street-based cars, yes. right? Yeah. So it's good to know what gear you were in and look at the data and figure out which one's optimal. Right, yeah. right, right. I really like that because as we look at my Apex Pro data, as I mentioned before in some of the articles, I can look back and see I could have went faster. My Apex score is a little bit low in this corner over here, but now this, I think this will really help me figure out which gear I need to be in to optimize my best time. Yeah, absolutely. And seeing your throttle application, right? Like right. Uh, it kind of gets rid of that, hey, I was flat here yeah. kind of mentality, right? Were you on the throttle or not? Now there's kind of a definite answer to that. Yeah. And it's super easy to use. It's only 129 bucks retail in addition to having the unit, but if you're not willing to jump in and buy the $450 Apex hardware, you can actually use it alone as well okay. and just log OBD2 data. So um, it's really useful for anything from autocrossing to professional racing, right, and, and anything in between. Um, I say most of our users are HPD track enthusiasts and club racers and a lot of time attack drivers too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of time attacks really starting to get into this. I see how it'd be super useful for me getting into time attack more seriously this year. Um, so talk to me about if I do this, it goes on the app, just like the Apex Pro does. Can I still share my data with you like I do on the normal Absolutely. app? Absolutely. You can still use Apple's AirDrop feature to share data between uh, drivers. So it's really easy to get your data from your device to another device. Right? We want to make data one step simpler. Data shouldn't be complicated, and it should be fun. Right? right? You can literally now sit at lunch with your buddies at the track and learn what you were doing differently and compare lap times and go a little bit deeper than that right? and see more about you know where you were gaining time versus uh, your friends and stuff like that and really have a more holistic conversation about driving, right? Right, right. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. You can follow along with me this year as I write about how the Apex Pro is helping me imp improve my driving. Thank you. Awesome. Another really cool thing at the PRI show is this V16 engine from KTEC. Now, this is basically two LS7s almost stuck together, but it's actually one complete bespoke block uh, with 16 cylinders, uh, dry sump, and it uses four LS7 heads and two LS7 intake manifolds. This engine can put out 2,500 horsepower, uh, like turbocharged, about half that naturally aspirated, and about 900 horsepower on pump gas even. Now the market for this is like the offshore power boats mostly, but they're gonna come out with automotive applications soon. Now, wouldn't this be sweet to stick in your car? Uh, like it's not that much longer than a uh, 2JZ maybe, but it's a lot of displacement and, and it's cooler than heck. So we're here at 4P with Luke. He's gonna tell us about this sweet K25 technically. Yeah. This is our Super 99 drag race engine. Um, this is a very class specific dedicated engine. Uh, in the past, People have seen some of our other engines with dry sump and 500 horsepower, 2.7 liters that we've built. This one is very specific for this class. We're allowed a little bit of a weight break um, if we run the smaller displacement and uh, factory stroke, which is 99 millimeters. And so we build this engine package around that. It's a little bit more affordable for the end user. Um, it, it also, uh, is a little less maintenance between rounds. So you can run this engine all season without having to tear it down. You're just changing oil and checking a couple timing components to make sure that they're in good condition. 
Um, but the idea was to use the smaller engine and, and turn more RPM. Uh, and it's proven to be a class dominating uh, concept. So this particular one actually ran um, the national record in our series, which is OGS 1320. So uh, for Honda Day and uh, some of the OGS events, uh, this package actually set that national record. And then we ran the same package at World Cup this year, um, where our engines also were, were the fastest uh, of our type for our class. So um, this particular engine makes uh, 480 horsepower on our Superflow uh, 902. Um, that, that's at 10,300 RPM. And we're going to turn this engine on the track uh, beyond 11,000. So we're turning past, you know, past peak. The engine's still carrying strong, and we're making sure that we got a good average horsepower for the for the range that we're in. So we'll we'll drop down to maybe 85 or 8600 RPM on gear changes, and then pull it up past 11. And uh, they just live forever. It's a good solid engine package that we've developed. And um, like right now, you know, the the top cars in that class even our customer cars are running the same 940 times that we are yeah. and that's you know that's the biggest thing for us it's one thing for us to go out there with our race program and our budget and you know show what we can do but when your customers can do it uh, and repeat what you're doing that's the biggest uh, you know feather in the cap for us is when they can they can do what we what we're selling so yeah. like you said you know uh, it, the work speaks for yourself, you know, it's, it's the customer went out there, dominated his class, and came back. And like you said, just an oil change, that's impressive. Yep. And it's still living. That's awesome. What, what do you... VTEC's kick in? Yeah, oh, yeah. So is VTEC actually locked on this? We do. We don't run VTEC uh, because we're, we're running in a very narrow power band. So it, it's pretty lightweight stuff. It's an aluminum rocker arm. It's a pretty big cam in this engine. Um, it, it is a, a cam that's kind of specific to four pistons, so I, I don't want to, you know, no, say exactly fine. what it is, but um, all really lightweight stuff. This has a 32-pound crankshaft in it, um, which, you know, a stock crank is either 39 pounds or 42 pounds. Uh, we've got a titanium rod in here. We've got a little piston. Um, everything's made for RPM, and, uh, you know, we are running steel valves still. Um, and it's a very specific cylinder head for this engine to allow it to carry power and be responsive. Um, our cars, when they leave the line, we're leaving with more horsepower than people think. So um, the, the engine's pretty stout. Um, and it's all about just reliability for us, valve stability, making sure that the customer can go beat this thing up, miss a gear. Things happen in racing. And, uh, you know, we don't want to be giving people excuses. We want to be giving them solutions and, and letting them, you know, actually race the car, not just, yeah. not something so fragile that they can't race it. Uh, you need to be able to make it through the season. So maintenance wise, uh, we go through, you know, timing equipment. We'll, we'll check, we'll lash them. We'll check, uh, you know, check basic. chain guides, chain, you know, tensioner, chain, basic stuff. Uh, but it's it's a good engine package and uh, it's proven pretty reliable and and pretty dominating in the class. Yeah. Do you uh, now what did he run in the quarter? Uh, this one went a 941, and the OGS record we did a 944. Oh wow. Uh, yeah. So um, all motor. All motor, and we're not. There's there's different classes yeah. now. We've got open fuel classes, which are nitromethane, and then we have pure all motor classes. So this is a pure all motor class. There's no nitromethane. There's no there's no additives. We we have to we get a displacement check. We have a fuel check, which is a water test, specific gravity, and some other means too. Uh, it, may, it may be it may involve bleach. They do fuel checks every round, oh, wow. every pass, every round, and so um, that's what this is for. It's the it's the part we love, you know, the all motor, where we're hustling and spending our life savings trying to find two horsepower. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's awesome. Or, or losing two horsepower or whatever we're doing, you know. So yeah. so you guys do the full four-piston head work and everything? And yep. We, we send this out, valve cover to oil pan, um, just like this, clutch, header. Like, we, we sell the whole setup. You can turn key. Uh, we'll, we'll sell it with the ECU uh -huh. to go out and run nine fours right off the bat. Now, how would this be in a street car? I know it might be kind of a dumb Rowdy. question, but some people would like to party and they would love to probably throw this in their car. It'd be way too much. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. all, it's an on-off switch. Like at 6,000 RPM, this thing comes on and it's wild. It's all like, the way to 11? yeah, it's on the, it just, it's, it's soft, soft, and then at 6,000 RPM, it just takes off. It feels like it got a hundred horsepower. So oh, that's awesome. Um, we do have 
street and road race versions of these engines. So like our road race engine will make about 380 or 390. Oh, wow. And it's, it's swinging pretty hard. That's yeah. with a good induction, you know, a race fuel like MS-109 okay. or E85. Um, but that's a that's a reliable road race setup, yeah. and everything's toned back. Dimensionally, the engine's the same, okay. but everything's toned back. Lower compression, steel rod, you know, heavier stuff that's going to live a long time. Yeah. Smaller camshaft. More reliability. Yeah. Right, but those are those are great. We we do a lot more road race stuff than we do drag race. Really? Yeah, but drag racing is uh, what we enjoy. So we post it a lot, and. Um, we're probably 75% endurance race, and the rest is street and drag. That's good to hear because you get people saying, well, you'll build that engine, it's not gonna last long. It's yeah. like, well, they've proven that it does. Right, so that's, that, awesome. that's the biggest thing. Any, you know, making horsepower is one thing. Yeah. Um, making it to where it can last uh, a long time and mm. actually serve the, the user, that's a whole different challenge, so. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Luke, it yeah. was awesome. Thank you, guys. Be sure to check out Four Piston, and uh, yeah. See you later. Great <laughs> outro. Hey guys, it's Ian and walking through PRI, we came across the Race Tools Direct booth where we, I saw this really neat uh, gadget here. Um, it's a fuel transfer pump and basically it eliminates the need to carry heavy things around here. I'm here with uh, Aaron and uh, hopefully he can explain a little bit about this and what makes it so cool. Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a fuel jug transfer pump. It's three gallons per minute. Just runs on four AA batteries. Um, very simple to operate. Just has an on-off switch. Turn it on. Fill up your jug. You can attach it onto the jug so you don't touch it. And within the end of the uh, end of the hose here, it actually has a sensor to shut the pump off when it gets full. Oh, it's so really you, neat, man. So if you forget, you walk away. Get some helpers that don't know what's going on. You're not going to get fuel out of the ground. Awesome. It's great for race cars, it's great for home use, you know, lawn mowers, snow blowers, that sort of thing as well. But uh, it really allows you to keep the fuel in the jug or in the race car and not all over the floor. Awesome. I really wish we had this and I think we might pick one up for our race team. Sounds great. All right, thank you for your time. Thanks, Ian. We're at the Magnus Motorsports booth and we're here to talk about their mechanical fuel pump. It's called the Magnus Motorsports MF Mechanical Fuel Pump. I'm here with Marco and we're going to talk about this. Would you like to tell me like what's new about this? Why is this so innovative and what kind of applications is this for? So uh, what's new and innovative about it? It is a very compact uh, gear order fuel pump, runs seven and a half gallons per minute. We, that's good for about 1,600 horsepower on methanol, 3,200 horsepower on gas. Um, all our components inside are DLC coated. Uh, we're using advanced, uh, advanced uh, materials. 4340, a uh, bunch of different mixes of stainless. And um, for now, in, in our testing, the pump was uh, shown to run really, really very high pressure rates. So for guys that are running big boost, uh, you're able to keep the fuel cooler and you're able to run uh, really high pressures. Okay. Um, one of the features we have is we've always had this uh, fuel pump kit that mounts uh, on the cam gear. So we do have a bunch of different cam gear driven kits. We have a distributor driven kit for the Honda and we also have uh, belt drive applications. This is a K-series belt drive application and in the future we're going to come out, we're going to be coming out with a bunch more uh, applications. Okay, awesome. So how quickly was does something like this prime? Um, because actually in our testing we kept getting tighter and tighter as much as we as, as, as tight as we could get on the tolerances the priming would work better. So we went through a lot of pain to get the tolerances uh, properly. It very much comes down to, on your vehicle, if you're just starting it, um, because you can start it at almost zero pressure, in your tune-up we usually would put uh, an extra prime pulse. But it still, it still primes right away. As soon as you've got, as soon as you got a couple of rotations and you've got your tune-up correct, then it will, it'll start Pretty right insane. away. Yeah, okay. yeah. So what kind of horsepower is this going to be for? What application, like what vehicles? Are we looking at road racers? Are we looking at everyday drivers? Well, here's the deal. So a lot of road racer guys, um, we've been solving their problems. If they've been boiling fuel because a lot of the electric, a lot of the electric cars, uh, sorry, electric pumps, a lot of the electric pumps are mounted in tank, etc., and they're really hopped up pumps. They're they're running higher voltage to them because they're trying to get the extra pressure. And with the Time Attack series guys, they're running insane amounts of boost. Yeah. To run insane amounts of boost, you need to run multiple pumps. So a lot of guys are running three, four pumps. We could fix all that with this and no wiring, right? Oh, wow. So. Also, because this is, you know, 
uh, tied to engine speed, mm -hmm. you're not always running it at full speed. Right. So you're not heating up the fuel right. as often. Mm -hmm. And it's basically an on-demand system. You don't need a huge regulator for our pump. Okay. So if you've got a car, like, even though this thing is rated, you can do 3,200 on gasoline, it's perfectly happy to run on 200, 300 horsepower car. It okay. doesn't care. Okay. Right? It doesn't right. care. And, uh, you know, you can have, a lot of guys have asked me, oh, do I have to run a monster regulator? No. <laughs> uh, the regular regulator, as long as you have a basically um, 100 thousandths orifice, mm -hmm. you're good to go okay. on the regulation. Yeah. So is this the only size that you offer, or is there a bigger size? Uh, currently, this is the only size we offer. This is the one we've introduced. Okay. Uh, so seven and a half gallons a minute again. And uh, later down the road, we already have uh, ideas, and people have asked for it for bigger pumps. Another good thing about the fuel pump and probably one of the best features is the inlet and outlet being on the same side. So this can mount inside V engines, on the side of engines. Okay. So you can get, it's much easier to do your plumbing. Whereas when you have a 180 with the conventional 180 degree plumbing, you always gotta usually put another 180 plumbing. Right. Yeah, yeah. So. so much easier to put this in. Absolutely one of the best features about it. Well, yeah. last question I'm gonna ask you, can I get this customized in a different color if I want it like that? For you, yes. <laughs> For awesome. everybody else, call me. Uh -huh, now you heard it. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And this is one of the coolest things I've seen at PRI this whole time. Thank you. Thanks. That's a wrap for PRI 2019. Kind of the last man standing here. Everybody else still scattered around trying to get it. Some last minute walkthrough through the halls. Hope you guys enjoyed what we brought you here. If you really like it, by all means, please subscribe to our channel. Give the video a like. Tell all your nerdy car friends about us. And we hope to be bringing you a lot more video and written content in the coming year. See you soon. So you have your own fuel cell now, right? Yes, we now have our own proprietary fuel cells that are made by <laughs> us and not by fuel cells. <laughs> Sorry. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>